Okay, uh, appreciate everybody joining this morning. Good morning to the Vancouver market. And uh, we welcome you to our uh, How to On-Ramp uh, GCI Roadshow here and uh, explaining or helping you with your uh, transition on how, how to create a successful hybrid cloud strategy. Uh, we'd like to uh, welcome our partners. Uh, along with our Cologix uh, crew, we have our, uh, our partners from Google Cloud, uh, who will talk about uh, GCI OnRamp, as well as our uh, local systems integrators uh, from uh, OpsGuru. And uh, just give you a quick high level, my name is Cameron Richardson. Uh, I'm in the hyperscale sales uh, team here at Cologix. And uh, our agenda for today is, uh, uh, first we'll have a quick overview. Actually, I'll do the overview of Cologix. Um, and uh, then we'll do a quick uh, physical site overview, a Vancouver market uh, segment from our uh, VP of, of um, I uh, apologize, our, our VP of Engineering and C Client Solutions, Danielle Walrin. Uh, Neil Olinsky, our General Manager of Cloud and Connectivity Platforms, will uh, take the stage for our uh, Cologix Access Marketplace Overview, which is our cloud fabric. And uh, we'll have the GCI team uh, come on board for their segment about uh, both Anthos and uh, the GCI product capabilities uh, Nick uh, D. Cristofario, uh, apologize, will uh, uh, be heading up the GCI side, and then John Bacon, the AtMod lead for uh, Google's partner engineering team, will uh, speak about Anthos. Um, Robin Percy, who is a CTO and co-founder of OpsGuru, will uh, then take the stage for a quick segment about um, OpsGuru's capabilities and how they can assist with the transition uh, from colo to cloud and uh, assist with your cloud strategies. Uh, following that, we'll have a quick question and answer period. So uh, feel free to ask your questions and we'll make sure to answer those uh, towards the end. Oh, I went too far there. Kathy, I don't know if you can back that up. Thank you. Uh, a quick overview on Cologix. Uh, many of you may know us in the Vancouver market. Uh, we do have three now going on four uh, facilities in the market. You've probably heard about our recent addition at Cordova. Uh, and Danielle will go into a little bit more detail about that. Uh, the history of Cologix really is on the interconnection side of the business. Uh, of the 11 markets that we operate in, we do um, control the meet me room in seven of those. Uh, so we do, uh, we, we have our roots in the interconnection side, but we have grown and evolved from there uh, to include now wholesale or like I like to call it wholetail uh, type of deployments um, in, our, in our markets as well. So do in inquire with your sales folks on the Cologic side, make sure that you're aware of what our capabilities are in each of the markets and each of the facilities uh, as we aim to, uh, to holistically um, support our customers, both from the uh, larger deployments down to interconnect retail side. Um, along with the obvious interconnection business, uh, we uh, pride ourselves on our, our partnerships with our cloud on-ramp providers, uh, which we have a wealth of across the portfolio, and you'll go into a little bit more detail about that as well. Uh, with that, I will move on to the next segment and uh, hand the keys over to Danielle Loren. Welcome everyone. Uh, uh, uh. Okay. Uh, we, uh, we are talking about uh, cloud on ramp and we mentioned hybrid cloud is what, what, what we found is that the reality is that uh, most of our clients have an hybrid cloud environment. Uh, what, what that means is that you do some stuff on the cloud, but you still need some of uh, the stuff done on your own server or your, or your own network equipment. So I just want to give you a little bit of a, what's hiding behind the cloud. Uh, actually, this is where Cologic, part of Cologic comes in. Uh, we need space to house the server, your network gear, your IT gear. So we have space uh, all through North America, but uh, we'll, a bit more specifically, we'll talk about the space we have in uh, Vancouver. 
and we need space, but we also, as you might, as you all know, we need reliable and redundant power and cooling to keep all your equipment running if you want your patient to uh, smoothly uh, keep going. And we need some physical security to make sure that uh, there's no intentional or accidental uh, harm done to any of your equipment. And in order to make all of that happen, uh, it needs people 24-7 uh, uh, being sending by and uh, performing a bunch of tasks. And this is where our uh, well uh, experience and, and, and uh, eye-level uh, upsteam comes in. So uh, this is a, a quick map uh, for those of you that might not be as familiar with Cologics. This is our footprint, as it says, uh, North American footprint. So we've got the major cities in Canada, Vancouver, Toronto, Montreal, and we've got a bunch of, of cities also uh, across the U.S. So uh, we're on the East Coast, the West Coast, in the middle. So we, we've got a, a few market there. And uh, as you can see, the little star is where our CAM, we call it, Cologics Access Market, is available. And Neil is going to talk to you about uh, that in greater detail. And... Uh, Cologix uh, is uh, footprint in uh, Vancouver looks a bit more like that. So for those of you that uh, most of you are probably familiar with Vancouver, we've got the airport in the lower left corner. Uh, we've got our three facilities, Van 4, which is our latest one, which is just recently acquired. Uh, all those Van 1, 2, and 4 are downtown, uh, a few kilometers from the airport. And we have one facility, which is a little bit... Uh, uh, east of uh, of downtown, which is Van Tree, uh, so and they're all interconnected, and uh, we'll give you a little bit more. Yeah, so this is a kind of a a bit more detail on our uh, on our different facilities. Van one, two, three. Van one, two, and four, closer to downtown, and Van Tree a little bit. It's uh, you know uh, as it says here, about nine kilometers away from uh, downtown. And this is a little bit of, uh, of a, a view of what the sites are and images. Van 1 is at 555 West Hastings. Uh, it's also known as Ar uh, Arbor Center. And it's the, it's the primary carrier hotel in uh, Vancouver. Uh, so we've got a very, uh, very dense presence in that building. We've got Van 2, which is not too far from uh, downtown uh, on 1050 West Pender. Again, we've got, we've got space in that building as well. And the, the latest one is uh, the former, for those of you that might know the, the market in uh, Vancouver, this is a former Zayo building. So we just acquired it. This is the way it looks right now, but we are uh, already uh, going uh, design and engineering to uh, beef up the capacity and uh, upgrade the building as we speak. This is on Cordova. It's just a few blocks away from our other uh, sites downtown. And uh, we'll give you a bit more detail about our Van 3 facility. This is a typical drawing we have for all of our sites. It gives you kind of what the building looks like from the street, uh, the typical satellite view. And this is just a drawing uh, of the site itself and showing the green uh, lines are the, the, the fiber path into the building. So this, this particular building has uh, two point of entry, A and B, uh, diverse with, uh, into two different pop and into two different meet me room. And this is a typical elevation of the building. This particular building is on two floor. So we've got space on the two floors. And uh, on this, uh, we'll, we'll give you a, a, just a one minute uh, of images of this site. Do I just click uh, play, Kathy, or are you uh, coming in with the... Uh... Oh, here you go. Whenever you're ready. Yeah, so this is our facility. That's the main gate at the, uh, at the entrance. This is the, the picture of what it looks like over the, the, the fence. We've got amenities there, kitchen accessible for our client for lunch, uh, meeting area. This is our, our lobby. Uh, a conference room that uh, can be shared with our client. And uh, this is one of the, the space. This is on the, the ground floor. Uh, some space that's already uh, installed on the second floor, data hall. And this is a typical uh, aisle uh, containment. Uh, just another view of the space available on the second floor. 
This is uh, one of our meet me room with a bunch of fiber already up and running. Some of the electrical room in UPS. Uh, another angle there, more of the UPS and batteries. And uh, th this is uh, the work of art of our chilled water piping, uh, loading dock area. And this is the cooling outside, the redund redundant cooling. It's a brand new facility that was just uh, revamped uh, just a, a few years ago. So that gives you an idea of what this looks like. Thank you, Kathy. And, uh, and, and of course, this is just, this is a state of the art facility, just uh, brand new, like just a few years old. There's runway for growth there, easily connect to the cloud and, and our Cologic ecosystem. And what you can see here is just that uh, it's our technician uh, performing various tasks of uh, upgrade, updating, upgrading this facility, installing some client, their cage or server. We've got a full team uh, ready there to help you in uh, any way uh, you need to uh, get you up and running for your hybrid cloud setup. So. And with this, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Neil for uh, our CAM section. I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Daniel. So why was he taking you through that? Uh, well, because we need to connect you from an on-prem site to the cloud, right? And part of hybrid cloud is to be hybrid, have that private side, have that cloud side, and get through an on-ramp um, to be able to connect those two. So... I can walk you through a little bit of taking that physical site of what he just showed you and then help walk you through uh, how you could then use that to get connected to uh, a cloud such as uh, Google Cloud with the Google, Google Cloud Platform um, with their interconnect uh, sites and options here. And really one of the easiest ways to do that is through a network exchange. So of course, we'll build on top of that physical side, walk you through a little bit of the network exchange story, so then I can hand off to the Google team to help take you a little bit further on this journey. So what you're seeing right here is the general overview of a hybrid cloud style environment. And really think there's, there's two ways you can do this. Uh, one being, well, over here on the left, you can see you have uh, in this kind of a fully spread out view of going from your headquarters or a branch office, something outside of the data center, tethering in through a carrier, typically to a site like a carrier hotel, like Cologix can provide there at, at the Harbor Center at 555 West Hastings. Bring that into a site and equipment, usually within that data center to help as your IO point from that facility. Now you could have your equipment there. Uh, this could be beyond just network gear, right? Uh, with those router switches, firewalls, and so on. Uh, you could also have some server storage and other details that you want really close to that cloud, both for the privacy and security aspect, because that way it is locked in a good facility right next to it with a limited number of hops to that cloud environment or to that ecosystem. Um, but you could also want to manage, again, that flow of traffic through on that. You want to cut down your latency on it by being as close to that cloud environment or other service providers as possible. All these benefits of being close, of shrinking your environment as much as possible. So our standard customer looks a little bit like this with that little rack of servers that you see there in network equipment uh, identified there. And they're going to tether in through a network exchange like our Access Marketplace uh, to help you spin up and spin down your circuits as needed needed to these providers and manage them in a hosted capacity, meaning that Cologix, we maintain that network to network interface at NNI to the provider, and we help just carve up little bits of that so you only purchase and manage what bandwidth you need when you need it, and you can then backhaul that on one of the many carriers in our data center in our meet me room to get back to your many sites, to your uh, employees and end users in a private, secure way. So why do you need this? Well, this bridge is hybrid. This makes a hybrid cloud. Um, what does it look like for a network exchange? Well, typically you're going to have uh, some sort of a port. So in this way, a one gig or 10 gig port is going to be our standard on this. Uh, we are working on 100 gig equipment that's being rolled out now, uh, but isn't quite live yet. Uh, but that'll allow you to cross connect. This is your physical layer one piece of your network connection, taking it from your equipment to our exchange that then allows you to use one port, one cross connect there, or ideally redundant here for 
best practice uh, to be able to get to tens to hundreds of providers, depending on your site and what you're looking for in this case. So you don't need to necessarily have five different cross connects to get five different connections to five different Google environments. You could have one connection and then you can provision circuits for your different usage. So those circuits being these ethernet virtual circuits and EVC, so we have down below. So if we walk through some of these speeds, you could have 50 meg to one development proof of concept environment. Uh, you could have 200 meg to a staging environment. And then you could have, say, redundant one gig going to your production environment. And all those could be handled across the same pair of ports. And we're just going to separate each one of those EVCs by a VLAN, helping you, again, create this one you need to, leave it running for as long as your project is needed, scale it up as required as your needs grow, and terminate it when you're done with that proof of concept or other projects that you're working for, making it really easy to build these connections in the way that you want as you need to uh, to get to great providers like Google. Now with that, we are focusing on Vancouver. So here's a little bit different view of that map that you just saw earlier, highlighting the many Google on-ramps that we have in our facilities. Uh, these on-ramps, meaning that is where the Google network equipment is for Google Cloud Interconnect, their network connection product uh, that we are a certified provider of, and we as a hosting provider can help get you connected in our facilities there to those Google on-ramps um, to help a handoff straight from you across our data center floor. And we can manage that and be from you to Cologix to that Google point, no matter which one of our data centers you're in. So if we're focusing up here in Vancouver, you see that number in the circle, that's the number of data centers that we have, as you see based on our key here. So four different data centers that Danielle pointed you to, if you're not in the same one as Google is, you now don't have to worry about, well, do I need a Metro Connect circuit? What kind of point to point? How do I get across the city to get there? And though we have some traditional products in our catalog to help with that, with the Network Exchange, if you are in Vancouver and Google is Vancouver as they are, we can help you create that circuit to build that hybrid cloud environment and bridge your private to your public cloud uh, systems and services there across a network link that we'll bring up in just a few minutes. So our average provisioning time on our platform for that EVC is about five minutes for Google to bring something up. All right, looking at that kind of side by side, well, this is the on-ramp. That's the network piece, right? But it's going to be transported from there across Google's incredibly diverse backbone uh, to get to the different Google compute regions. So if we look at this kind of on a map side by side, left hand side here, you see the Google cloud platform regions where their servers are hosted, where your services are going to be running. On the right hand side, you see where those on ramps are across Ecologic's footprint and how there's a good lineup of a lot of those across the board to help you get to multiple sites. Now, if you can get to one, you can get to all the compute. So from Vancouver, you would be able to connect onto their network and then they will transport you on their back backbone out of Vancouver to their Oregon region, their Salt Lake City region, their Iowa, the Montreal region, the upcoming Toronto region. Um, there's a lot there that they will take you to all from that one point. So if you're in market, again, you can cut down your hops, which cuts down your risk to get to Google. That's less fiber that can have an issue. And you get very close to Google, so you can hop onto the network to get to their regions to manage, again, this hybrid cloud multi-site environment per best practice, what you're really going to be hopefully looking for there um, as a team. Quick question, Neil. Uh, yes. Can you make a mention of how CAM differentiates to using cloud connection from carriers who might position as extension of client and PLS? Of course, yeah. We, we do have a number of great carriers who do connect to this Google on-ramp in the Vancouver region with us as well, and they will provide that uh, connectivity and service back as part of a larger MPLS package, right? So that's one way to do that, um, that you'd be able to join in. And that looks a little bit, if I can go backward here, um, and think it could go like this. So if you are not in a Cologix data center, of course, you can still get to those nodes by contracting from back here through a carrier, that carrier's equipment would take the place of these racks right here instead of your own. And that carrier would be providing the connection through either through a marketplace or directly to Google, depending on where they're positioned. So yeah, we do have carriers that can provide that. They provide a ton of last mile services and we love to support them. So we are a carrier neutral facility. And what we're providing here is a foundational service. We're trying to do layer one and layer two to help people get connected and then get out of the way. Um, in that way, we allow carriers to build on top of our service. Like I said, they can resell from here or use this to manage a dynamic connection or 
they can use this as a cross connect instead of going through the Ecologix marketplace to get to the ecosystem, they may have their own cross connect straight to Google. So yeah, the, the left section are the carriers. Those carriers, some of them are on our exchange as well and this access marketplace. So meaning you can use this marketplace to create those EVCs I had. These are virtual cross connects right down here. You can use those to get to carriers, to get to service providers, to get to clouds, to have multiple types of connections in and across our data center. So again, our, our focus here as Cologix is to help with that private side of the hybrid cloud story of being that um, site where you can put your servers and your equipment to connect to other carriers, other providers, and other clouds. And we have two different ways to do that. I'm highlighting our most flexible here, which is our access marketplace. It is a network exchange versus a cross connect or a, a metro connect which would help as well those are our point-to-point -point fiber based services that you could have as well so happy to stick around later go through a little bit more i don't want to take away too much time uh from our, our great partners on here of, of google uh and others here to, to help today um so we'll spin on through if you have more questions later happy to address them with the audience uh, after we get through the rest of the presentation but just remember this is one way to get you connected in our footprint in our data centers with one of our products if you want to be right there side by side with google uh, we have a platform that'll get these circuits spun up for you in about five minutes for that and that you can turn down when you're done with them and how easy is this well we do it in four steps so step one would be going to in this case uh google's uh console you would then create what they call a vlan attachment this gets you a key cloud key um, that they call a pairing key this is going to look similar for some of the other clouds and service providers that we serve you go into their portal you create a request for a circuit they give you a key come back to us for step two you're going to then go to our access marketplace you'll select google as an option from there we have a little tile for them you would then select uh, your port that you want to create that ethernet virtual circuit that or as I said, it's a type of virtual cross connect on there. And you'd submit that key. We read that key, check in with Google and uh, confirm all the details of the location you're going to, how you want it set up, the speed of that connection, put in a few other details of it and check out in our shopping cart. As soon as you check out, it'll light up that service. You'll go back to the Google console. You will activate it. This is a extra security step that the Google team have put in place just for your own security of your environment, make sure that it is actually you logging back in with authority to say, yes, I requested this, I want this set up, because this again is a private fiber circuit that we're gonna be setting up between your private environment and your public cloud. So we wanna put a couple extra checks in there. Google's gonna do that as well, just to make sure, yes, it is you, yes, you authorize this. You're gonna accept it. As soon as that's up, bam, layer two is done. You're gonna have a VLAN end to end. You're gonna see MAC addresses coming across your line. You'll configure your layer three with that BGP piece on there. That'll bring up your peering, your IP addressing, and you're done. You're online. Everything's good. So really four main steps. Create the attachment, get the key, plug that key into the Cologix portal. Once that's done, you'll just click to activate and authorize that connection in Google. Set up your layer three. You're up and running. Uh, I've seen customers get through this really end-to-end -end in 20 to 30 minutes. Um, pretty quick process uh, over you know maybe six weeks or so to, to go through all the physical interconnection that you may have had to go through with more traditional methods in the past. All right, with that, my time is over. I have talked more than enough. I'm gonna turn it back over to the great team here to, to take you on to the next step. Thanks everyone. Hi all, so as promised, uh, attendees are eligible to win a $100 Amazon gift card. And to do so, you can join us for a quick Kahoot game. We're asking some questions about the Olympics. So if you wanna go on to kahoot.it on your mobile device or in your web browser, you'll be able to then enter the game pin that we're showing on the screen. Um, if you have Zoom apps enabled, you can also enter that way as well. You should still see that number on the top of the screen. Not this number, ignore this number, please. <laughs> I'll just give folks a moment to join.
you one more moment, I will hit start. We will be playing again later today. So uh, what you want to do is you want to be the fastest and you want to be right. Let's see, you know, if you uh, have been missing the Olympics. So you want to answer on your, your phone or device. And the answers will be showing on screen. What year were Olympic gold medals last made of solid gold? Okay, B's on our leaderboard. What year did the NBA Dream Team participate in the Olympics? Okay, A, B's still the top, and we have Mika coming up right behind him. Question three, you have to get both of these right. Which winter Olympic sports were originally part of the Summer Olympics? Captain Canada's number three. Mika is number two. ABC is number one. Way to go, guys. And with this, I will move us on to our next post. All right, um, so good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on uh, where you're calling in from. And uh, my name is Nick De Cristofaro. I'm a network specialist customer engineer with Google Cloud. So what does that mean? That means I spend uh, most of my time helping customers with uh, network products and services. So really helping them build um, you know, network architectures and network solutions within GCP. And uh, today I'd really like to talk to you about uh, about our Google Cloud Interconnect product and how to extend uh, your on-prem network through a highly available low latency connection uh, with, with GCP. But first, I'm really thrilled to announce the launch of our new Google Cloud Interconnect location at CoLogix Vancouver Van 2. So you'll be able to directly connect from CoLogix to GCP via a dedicated low latency connection and uh, I'll uh, like to talk a bit more about the architecture itself. And Niels talked about the uh, cloud access marketplace, uh, specifically within CoLogix. So I'll, I, I'm going to focus a little bit more about the dedicated interconnect components of it, as well as how this fits in from an architectural standpoint. So here on the right, uh, you can see that you have your CoLogix connection. So that's either where your, your physical footprints are located within CoLogix, so your workloads. They're either locally within a CoLogix facility or they could be somewhere else and then cross-connected through to CoLogix in this case. And this is where um, an Anthos deployment, for example, which we're going to talk to afterwards, uh, could be located there or any other types of workload as well. So really this is a, you know, you can think of this as a footprint to host uh, infrastructure. And in this case here, you can see that uh, you would typically have uh, some, some type of routing equipment, so routers that would be located within uh, the facility, or it could be, again, somewhere else and cross-connected back to the facility. Now, this is establishing a, a BGP connection to the, uh, the far left, which is actually the GCP project. Now, I want to focus a little bit about the middle components here, which is where the dedicated interconnect components exist, right? So what Neil has been talking about in terms of the, the uh, CoLogic Access Marketplace which I'll have a slide uh, discussing how, the, how this kind of fits into this architecture. This is really about the end customer, such as yourself, for example, having a direct connection to Google, uh, owning really the entire uh, port that's connected back to our fabric. Now, what's important here is that we have two zones within uh, the Interconnect product portfolio, and we call these zones availability or edge availability domains. And you'll see these when you actually order these circuits uh, within our, our, our portal, 
as well as when you're selecting it through the uh, Ecologic Access Marketplace, for example. And these zones are important because they provide uh, different availability domains. And this is uh, required when you're uh, to obtain an SLA from us in terms of uh, uh, availability. And we offer two different types of SLA depending on the design, uh, both three nines and four nines. Now you can see here a typical uh, connection to have an SLA would require these two zones to be connected. And these two zones establish two independent BGP sessions across these uh, virtual connections that are called VLAN attachment, as Neil mentioned, and they terminate on a virtual uh, BGP control plane speaker, which we call the cloud router within GCP. Now this cloud router is a regional object. So in this case, it exists uh, for, for the sake of example in US West one, which is our Oregon region the closest geographical location to Vancouver. And here I have uh, additional workloads, for example, workloads in US West 2 and US West 3. So this is both LA and Salt Lake City. And we have a functionality within uh, Google Cloud, which is called global routing. <clears throat> and what this does is it actually allows you to connect to a single location uh, within uh, the physical footprint. So for example, here in, in Cologic in Vancouver, establishing a virtual connection down to a cloud router in Oregon, but have access to all the remote regions using the concept of global routing. So this gives you the ability to have access to workloads in a DR, a DR site or additional uh, workloads in a remote site elsewhere. Now, looking at the partner interconnect model, which is what Neil's been uh, discussing in terms of the Cologic Access Marketplace, you can see here that the architecture looks very similar. The only difference is that in the middle component, the box which actually hands off the physical connection between the Google peering edge, it is no longer directly with an end customer, but with Cologic itself, which is through their uh, Access Marketplace. So the, from, from a connectivity standpoint, it's very, very similar. The only difference is really how it's provisioned. And Neil has talked about the provisioning steps, uh, obtaining a service or a service key, which we call a pairing key, uh, and then entering that into the Cologic Access, play, uh, Access Marketplace service provider portal, and then establishing the connection that way. So really the physical handoff between Google in this case is really with Cologic, as opposed to the previous uh, topology, which was the dedicated interconnect model, which is directly with, with you as an end customer. So it's really whoever owns the port is really the difference here. And then the provisioning, uh, it, the, the provisioning standpoint is a little bit different, but as far as an architecture goes in terms of connecting the VLAN attachments to a cloud router and then accessing Google services, it's identical. It's just depending on the type of connectivity model uh, that you're, you're looking for. Next, here is a demo on how to order a dedicated interconnect through our portal. So you would go through the portal, order a new dedicated interconnect uh, connection. And here you give it a name, for example, in this example, Vancouver Cologic. And this is where you would select the location. So this is if you want to provision a dedicated interconnect circuit directly from your, uh, your facility in, in Cologic in your location into a port uh, with Google. So again, this is from the dedicated interconnect standpoint. And, uh, the cloud, uh, the, the Cologic Access Marketplace that Neil mentioned is actually there on the first slide of this animation. That's where you would go and, and actually provision the, um, the pairing key and so on. So two different use cases used for different types of connections. Uh, just wanted to show that this is how you order a, uh, a dedicated circuit and how you, uh, you select the facility through our portal. Well, let's talk about the costs associated with, uh, with the interconnect itself. So the dedicated interconnect uh, has, uh, as I mentioned, the, the end customer, such as yourself, would own the GCP port. You actually own the entire port, the full 10 gig or 100 gig bandwidth of the port, and you would build attachments directly through the cloud console. So in, within GCP, you go and create a VLAN attachment associated with that port, and that goes and, and gets extended all the way to your uh, on-prem uh, routing equipment. On the partner interconnect side, as Neil showed in his uh, presentation, the partner, for example, Cologic, owns the actual GCP port. And then you as an end customer would build the attachments via the partner's portal. And then you accept the connection in GCP using that pairing key. Now, the VLAN attachments are provisioned depending on uh, different uh, bandwidth levels. Now, specifically for partner interconnect, you have a, a lot more uh, uh, bandwidth available uh, options, right? Starting all the way from 50 megabits all the way to 
a 50 gigabit circuit on a 100 gig uh, connection. And the bandwidth uh, really uh, charges a different per hour fee when you're looking at a partner interconnect model. Similarly, on the dedicated interconnect model, because the 10 gig, uh, the entire 10 gig port is really owned uh, by you as an end customer, the minimum is 10 gig, and then you have 20 and 50 on 100 gig circuits. So they vary on a, a per hour, a per hourly rate depending on the the attachment capacity that you have. Now the uh, the other part is the egress charges. So egress charges from GCP to on-prem offer a significant discount when you use an interconnect product such as dedicated or partner interconnect. And for example, our retail pricing for that is of two cents per gigabyte in North America. So it's a significant discount as opposed to a uh, egress standard egress charges that would uh, occur if you have uh, connections through a public internet circuit, for example. And lastly, if we talk about how the VLAN attachments are, are, are some of the technical components behind the VLAN attachments and how they're actually established. And Neil covered this a little bit in terms of BGP peering. So BGP peering, again, from our diagram, it is between you as an end customer and Google Cloud, specifically towards the Google Cloud router, which sits within a VPC. And routes are uh, dynamically advertised between these two. All right, so this is something established between end to end between yourself and GCP, irrespective if it's dedicated or partner interconnect, depending on the, the connectivity type, especially if it's a, a layer two connection. If it's layer three, it's a little bit different, but layer two connection, it's between your on-prem router directly to GCP. Now, it is an external BGP uh, neighbor uh, peering relationship, and this requires you to have multi-hop configured. And the VLAN attachment, the really interesting part here is that as I mentioned in the, in the diagram, uh, if you look at the Vancouver Van 2 location, you can actually connect to any metro edge to any to access any region in the same continental region, meaning you can connect at Cologic Van 2, but then directly establish a VLAN attachment if you don't have a, a, a need to connect, for example, to US West 1 in Oregon, but you want to deploy workloads directly in LA or directly in other locations, you can directly establish a VLAN attachment to a remote region. And we allow you to establish that communication between a, a on-ramp, specific on-ramp, let's say Cologic Van 2 to any other location within the same continental region. So that's in, in North America. And there's no additional cost to do this. You can establish directly a circuit to these, uh, to these remote locations uh, via, our, um, via our, our cloud console. And with that, um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out. Also, please see the link to uh, the documentation on Partner Interconnect and Dedicated Interconnect. At the end of the webinar, there's going to be a link there. And uh, for now, I'll hand it off to my colleague, John, to talk about Anthos. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. Uh, good morning or good afternoon. Um, my name is John, and I am the AppMod lead for Google Cloud's Partner Engineering Team. So I work with our customers and our services partners when it comes to anything AppMod which includes a hybrid and uh, multi-cloud. So today I'm gonna to give a brief overview of a platform we have called Anthos. Um, it's our solution to hybrid and multi-cloud. A couple things to note before I get started. Um, it's not a single product. It's actually a suite of products that come bundled together. I'm not gonna go into every component, but I'll briefly highlight some of the core components that I, I think add a ton of value to our customers. Um, Second, I'll keep it high level, but uh, I might dive deep every once in a while. Um, but again, the, the takeaways are, what is the business value from some of these components um, when you start looking at a, a hybrid cloud environment? If anyone at your company wants a deeper understanding of the product or hybrid and, and multi-cloud at Google, I'm happy to have a follow-up conversation or connect you with uh, the Google resources that support your company. So um, most organizations have already kind of taken that leap to public cloud, or at least built a strategy and are thinking about it. Um, but a lot of workloads still remain on-prem, and they're going to continue to do so for a while. And there's lots of reasons for this. Proximity to end users, compliance, data locality rules, and so on. So we understand that while you're building out a cloud strategy, a big component of that is going to be hybrid and multi-cloud. And, and how do you handle that? So the, the problem is, whenever you start to do that, some challenges arise. Um, security versus agility, right? Developers want to push code to production quickly. Doesn't matter where that infrastructure is. But the security teams want to ensure the code is safe, right? The tools used by the developers are going to be verified and trusted. And that sometimes can slow down the development process. 
reliability versus cost. When people think of reliability, you think of adding redundant machines, data protection tools, and other services that will increase your costs. And lastly, this is a big one, is portability versus consistency. If I start to run modern applications across different environments like on-prem or multiple clouds, I want to make sure that my application is portable. It's, there's no lock in there, right? And at the same time, there's a consistent experience. So as an infrastructure team, right, I want to deploy on-prem or maybe in Google Cloud or, or somewhere else. Um, I want to do that without having to make significant changes or adopt a lot of new different tools. So how does Anthos help with all that? Uh, first, I'm going to reiterate, it's not a single product, right? It's a suite of products when working together helps solve the challenges I just mentioned. I'll briefly discuss some of these components over the next couple slides. Um, but before that, just here's some high-level benefits that Anthos provides. I won't go through all of them, but just highlight a couple, like write once, deploy anywhere. This means that a developer doesn't have to build their application differently, depending on the environment it's going to be deployed into. Consistency, consistency across environments. So whether I'm a security engineer, an infrastructure admin, or a developer, Anthos is going to provide a consistent set of tooling that I can leverage no matter what environment I'm going to deploy to. And as I speak about some of these components, you'll see how the rest of these benefits are achieved. So before I dive in, um, I like to set the stage for who within your organization this actually applies to. So the different components of Anthos can provide various benefits depending on your role. Um, so as I talk about uh, some of these components, I may focus more on an application owner or a developer or the infrastructure or platform teams or how a security admin or security engineer would, would see benefit from a certain component. It's also just really quick, uh, important to note that not all, but a lot of the components of Anthos are built on top of open source products. Um, this really helps with that, uh, you know, portability and consistency when you're moving around different environments like on-prem and Google and helps avoid any sort of lock-in. Okay. So what is Anthos and where can I deploy it? So like I mentioned before, it's a suite of components that helps with things like policy management, cluster management, and so on. that can be deployed either on-prem, at the edge, or across multiple different clouds. So as I drill down, you can see some of the components which I'm going to briefly discuss for the remainder of the presentation. Things like Anthos GKE, Anthos Service Mesh, and a few more that you can see here. Also, uh, look at the bottom. We have different deployment options for on-prem that you can deploy directly onto VMware or bare metal. Um, we also support running Anthos on top of other clouds. So AWS and Azure, if for some reason you're running a multi-cloud environment, Anthos can help give you that consistent experience across those clouds as well. And then at the very right, you see attached clusters. What this means is um, if you're already running a Kubernetes cluster somewhere that is not a Google cluster, um, so EKS, AKS, or something like OpenShift in your on-prem data center, um, you can actually connect that cluster back to your Anthos console um, and view and monitor that cluster and have some of the benefits of Anthos with those clusters as well. Um, and then later, you know, move on to GKE if it makes sense. Okay, so let's talk about just a couple of the components quick before I hand it off. Um, one of the core components and kind of the foundations of Anthos is Anthos GKE. So what's important to understand here is really what is GKE, right? And a little of the history behind it. Uh, GKE is Google Kubernetes Engine. Um, it's our managed version of Kubernetes that's available in GCP today. Now, admittedly, you know, Google was a little late to the cloud game. Uh, but when it comes to Kubernetes, we have the most experience and the most mature offering out there. And this is really important because it's not a secret that Kubernetes is the de facto standard for container management, but it's also no secret that setting up Kubernetes isn't easy. Uh, it's pretty difficult and cumbersome if you start from scratch and you use open source Kubernetes. Not only that, but it becomes even more confusing when you start to look at day two operations, things like upgrades, monitoring and logging, security operations, and so on. In fact, a lot of customers that try to deploy Kubernetes on their own oftentimes fail because they don't have a good plan on how to handle those day two operations. So that's why having a managed version, something like GKE is actually really important. Uh, GKE assists our customers with uh, you know, making cluster creation easy. 
There's a lot of advanced cluster management features like load balancing and auto scaling, auto upgrades and repairs, as well as built-in logging and monitoring. All of this happens with very little effort from a developer or an infrastructure team. So once you take your code and you throw it in a container, it's very easy to create a cluster using either our console, our command line interface, um, or the, the API. It's pretty easy to do, and it doesn't require someone that has an intimate knowledge of Kubernetes. So as I mentioned, Anthos is a lot of products. At the core, we have Anthos GKE. It's taking that mature enterprise-ready distribution of Kubernetes that we already provide within GCP, and it's bringing that to your own private data center um, or another cloud. Uh, here is what it looks like in the console. Um, it's kind of hard to see here uh, in the middle, but um, it shows a bunch of clusters that you have deployed. Um, here we have examples of GKE that's running in GCP. We have a couple of clusters that show on-prem as well. Um, if you had clusters running in any environment, uh, they would show up in this kind of single, this view right here. Okay, so the next component that I'm gonna talk about is Anthos config management. So think about if you have one team that deploys Kubernetes, right? That team has to worry about enforcing policies for the cluster that they're, they're setting up. How do I put in security guardrails in place? That might not be extremely difficult for a single cluster. But now that team, you know, they start telling everybody else within the IT organization that Kubernetes is great and they're deploying these clusters. So everybody starts to use it, right? And now another team and another team. And now you have clusters running across your entire company. Some may be on-prem in your Ecologix data center. Some may be in Google Cloud or, or somewhere else. Um, or even if it's a similar environment, but you just have you know, hundreds or thousands of clusters, which is an example that we see with retail customers a lot of times, where they'll run small Kubernetes clusters in each store or in each fast food restaurant. So in these scenarios, how do I ensure that the policies that I set are going to be enforced, right? How do I make sure that there's not an admin in one of these branch locations or in a data center somewhere that makes a change to a cluster um, how, how do I make sure that that change doesn't take place if they're not supposed to do that, right? Or if it, if it switches something that we don't want to happen? And the answer is config management. So config management lets, lets you define and enforce policies across all of your Kubernetes deployments. What happens is you get a central Git repository that manages things like access control policies, RBAC, you know, resource quotas and namespaces, whether it's on-prem or in the cloud. And config management is declarative. So it's continually checking your cluster state and applying that desired state to enforce those policies that you set. Um, it also puts in security guardrails. So as an administrator, you need to create a consistent environment um, that's gonna offer security by default for your developers. So whenever you deploy a new environment, you wanna do it very quickly and you wanna have the confidence that that configuration and that cluster state that you define is going to be applied. So that's what config management helps with. Um, it's going to help you, you know, maintain control over cluster sprawl. Um, as more and more teams start to, you know, adopt Kubernetes within your organization or grow their environments for things like redundancy or to expand to new geos or for whatever reason, um, you're increasing the overhead in managing all of those configurations. And config management's here to solve that problem by delivering a single centralized place to help you with multi-cluster management. All right, so the last component I'm going to talk about as part of Anthos is Anthos Service Mesh. If you're not familiar with the Service Mesh, don't worry. All you need to know is that a Service Mesh is going to automate a lot of functionality into your network. A lot of the benefits are things that a developer might have to actually code into their application. But with Anthos Service Mesh, the developer doesn't have to worry about any of this. The three main things that I like to talk about when I'm uh, mentioning Anthos Service Mesh is observability, operational agility, and policy-driven security. With observ observability, ASM, or Anthos Service Mesh, is going to monitor things like your error rates, your latency, traffic, and saturation out of the box without you having to set up anything. So that way, you can take those metrics and you can create an SLO. Um, it's also going to build topology graphs to show you how your services are interacting with each other and show that for you right in the console without adding any third-party software to do that. So that way you know which services are communicating to which and which services can't communicate to which. The second thing is operational agility. So when I deploy an application, as a developer, I need to account for things like, um, what happens if a service fails, right? Uh, circuit breaking, 
is, is if my service fails, is that going to cascade downstream and, and impact other services? Um, with Anso Service Mesh, you can make sure that it doesn't. Or how do I handle routing between different applications? What if my application is running on-prem and I want to send traffic to the cloud as part of a Canary rollout to test it out? Anthos Service Mesh can do all of that for you without a developer actually having to modify their code or make any changes. Or even if I have, let's say, a, a website and I have an a English version and a French version, um, Anthos Service Mesh can, can look at the packets coming in and saying that these are coming from a certain uh, a geo, um, so we're going to give the English version of my website or the French version, depending on, on who that user is. So there's a lot of really cool things that you can do with Anthos Service Mesh. The last thing is policy-driven security. Um, and really what this means is Anthos Service Mesh handles all of your cert certificate management, as well as authorization and authentication between those services. It's also going to add MTLS to encrypt the traffic that's going between uh, each service. OK. so. Each one of these components, we could actually talk about for a few hours and really deep dive. And there's, a, there's other components that come as part of the Anthos suite. So um, the, the takeaway is, you know, when you start to build out a hybrid cloud or multi-cloud environment, you're often faced with different software licenses and inc an inconsistent experience because you're, you know, adding multiple different tools. Um, this adds work for your infrastructure teams and the application owners because they have to make all the adjustments for the new environments. And with Anthos, the goal is to handle all of that for you and provide that consistent environment. OK, so what, some of you might be thinking, I'm not using Kubernetes, right? What about legacy applications? What about managing virtual machines or, or Windows workloads? So if you're not ready to, to you know, modernize your application and, and run in containers, um, Anthos does have support for VMs coming soon. You can already run Windows containers in GKE on GCP. Um, but more importantly, how do you even get started, right? Who do you talk to about this? And at Google, we like to work really closely with our services partners. It's somewhat of an extension of our team. Uh, partners like OpsGuru. Um, so with that, I'm going to actually pass it off to Robin, who's the CTO from OpsGuru. Thanks very much, John. Uh, looks like that might have clicked one further than we intended. Let me see if I can get back. There we go. Uh, thanks, everyone. So uh, as John said, uh, my name is Robin Percy. I'm, I'm CTO and co-founder of OpsGuru. We're, uh, we're a DevOps consultancy that, uh, that specializes in a uh, hybrid multi-cloud and, uh, and data analytics services uh, based out of, out of Vancouver. And we've been working with Google for a number of years now. We're a, uh, a premier partner that uh, has, has worked closely with Google PSO in the, in the US as well as Canada on, uh, on many of these hybrid projects. Uh, particularly around uh, Kubernetes, Anthos, and um, and and hybrid enablement with uh, with application modernization. Uh, most recently, we were uh, acquired by a, a another Canadian company, Carbon Sixty, that specializes in managed services. And so, we're very excited now to have the joint capability of providing a, a managed services story on top of the enablement and cloud adoption that we've been uh, been offering to date. And we'll go into to how that applies, particularly around these, these hybrid uh, workloads and, and use cases over the next few slides here. So in our typical adoption journey with, with customers, um, we, we generally start with customers that are either uh, just taking their first steps into the cloud and, uh, and, and, and getting their, their, their feet wet or their initial workload set up or coming into larger enterprises that have started that journey but are looking to remediate based on some of the, the challenges they've, they've faced to date. So the, the slide here is really showing a, a number of the, the services and, and um, practices that we'll, we'll provide uh, anywhere from the, that initial adoption to going into more of a modernization with customers that may have uh, Kubernetes platforms already enabled 
that they're looking to really take the next step on modernizing their applications further so that they can take advantage of the Anthos service mesh, um, adopt more modern uh, operational capabilities around um, monitoring and release uh, practices and, and how they're setting up uh, blue-green deployments or canary deployments, those sorts of things, uh, and then moving that into a, an environment that that we can manage for them or enable them to, to feel comfortable managing themselves after going through a, a cost optimization, performance optimization sorts of, uh, of exercises with them. So throughout this entire journey, obviously things like uh, security and performance are at the top of mind. And one of the, the, the areas I'd like to talk about today is really when we're looking at these hybrid environments, how do we, how do we first ensure that we're um, maximizing or in enhancing the security posture? And really what, what does something like Interconnect and Anthos provide as far as features that really let us improve and, and enhance that security posture of existing workloads? And when we're talking about hybrid cloud, obviously there's, there's a few different areas that we we know there are, are benefits in for the application teams themselves and the and the DevOps teams. Obviously, there's there's the benefits around integrating with cloud services. There's the flexibility in, in where you're hosting your applications as well as how you're hosting them, whether it's going to, to serverless or going to Kubernetes. Um, the the ability to take advantage out of the box of the, the managed platforms that Google provides is obviously key to this. And, and I think John did a great job describing much of that. The, the area again that, that we'll dive into in these slides is really around the how that then can be taken a step farther to really enhance that security posture of your applications. And three, three of these, uh, of the key, concepts or technologies provided by Google that we'll be talking about. Um, while Partner Interconnect has already been obviously discussed quite quite a bit in depth, but that's laying the, the, the foundation for being able to take advantage of these other two, namely the private Google access and VPC service controls. So we'll go into each one in a, in a bit more depth, but essentially the private Google access is allowing us to access Google's APIs uh, with private IPs um, via the, the virtual private cloud that we're connecting to with Interconnect. And then the, the VPC service controls are providing this extra layer of, of quite powerful security to avoid exfiltration risk of, of data and really control who and what is accessing the, uh, the services up in the cloud. So starting with the, the VPC service controls, what these enable is, is for us to, uh, to designate projects or, or, or security um, boundaries in the cloud based on Google resource descriptions that we can then specify exactly who and what are able to access those APIs. So we'll look at an, an example in a, in a few slides here, but. The key is that by, by really locking down um, where things can be accessed from, particularly which, which networks or which virtual private clouds um, APIs can be accessed from, we significantly reduce the risk of exfiltration of, of somebody being able to compromise a workload and ship data out of that, that service. So by, by setting these trust boundaries and these service perimeters, we're able to really lock down um, where that data is being transmitted, um, the sources and destinations, as, as well as who's accessing it. Uh, the next piece, uh, as I mentioned, is, uh, is avoiding um, needing to, to transit public networks uh, to access those APIs, especially when we're, when we're transmitting large amounts of data back and forth. So when we have something like an interconnect tying us and connecting us directly to a virtual private cloud uh, in, in Google Cloud, we're able to use these features to really make sure that we're, we're only accessing the private endpoints of these APIs um, with, with some minimal configuration. So typically to set this up, you, you would um, 
configure routes for the, the, the privately advertised IP addresses of the Google services, uh, set up DNS and, and firewall rules accordingly. And then your workloads can access services from on-prem um, through Google's network without, again, having to, to transmit uh, anything through the, through the public internet. So putting this all together to, to illustrate uh, the, how these, these various aspects layer on top of each other, this is a, not an exact use case that, that we've gone through. It's more representative of, of the patterns that we see a lot of our data and analytics customers using to really take advantage of this security. So in this case, it, it has the on-premise workloads running in a, in a GKE on-prem uh, via Anthos. Uh, and then has the connection up to Google through Interconnect, uh, and then is, is able to access cloud storage and a vision API uh, through those, those private endpoints or private IP access. And what that's allowing us to do is use those uh, VPC service controls to say, okay, um, only, only workloads from within this VPC or the, the VPC that we've connected the on-prem workloads to via interconnect are able to store the, the raw data up in cloud storage and, and take advantage of the, the security models that cloud storage provides, as well as uh, invoking those, those vision APIs to extract metadata and, and perform analysis on the images themselves, all, all transiting through that private network. So not only are we getting the advantages of integrating advanced services, advanced managed services like the Vision API, we're also getting these, these uh, benefits of the, the rich security model that, that Google provides that we can then layer into our application that trying to implement that purely on-prem um, is a, a, significant, a significant effort in its own. And, and here we're able to use the, the, the trusted and proven um, mechanisms that, that Google provides. So with all of that, um, this is the exact sort of um, use case that, that OpsGuru will uh, like specializes in, in helping design, helping implement and, and helping migrate to as customers are coming in uh, and either looking to, to build out their, their current a cloud footprint or taking their first steps into moving to this, this hybrid cloud process. And as far as how we, how we help, um, we have uh, our, our Google, or sorry, our uh, Cloud Launchpad uh, product for hybrid and multi-cloud. And what this is, is a, a, a best practices based um, set of, um, of, of, tooling and, uh, and, and infrastructure as code that we, we work with customers to roll out, to uh, customize for their environment and really make sure that they're getting the, a, a maintainable and sustainable first footprint out in the cloud. Um, or if, if in the case of customers that have already established some, some cloud footprint in remediating that and, and adopting these best practices into it. So we really focus on the on these four key areas of first educating customers on, on the, the key capabilities and the, the key concerns that they, they want to be aware of around how you're structuring resources in the cloud to take advantage of things like uh, security perimeters and service perimeters, as well as capabilities like uh, private access and, and all of the all of the services that, that fall under that uh, umbrella. Um, as we go through that process, we, we capture the particulars of the use case of our clients so that we can make the adjustments and, and structure their, their resources and their, their cloud infrastructure in a way that, that works for their applications and their, their goals. And then uh, finally, going through the delivery and, and uh, vetting and verification of the, on the security side of the, the solution we're working with customers to, to uh, have that final uh, handover where they're either comfortable operating the infrastructure or comfortable uh, using the infrastructure that we're able to manage with our, with our uh, Carbon 60 team.
So that's that's the, the cloud launchpad aspect and, and really the high level process that we go through to enable these these more rich um, these more rich uh, capabilities through hybrid cloud. And this is just an example of the sort of um, organizational structure and resource structure that we would deploy. Uh, anyone that has worked with with Google Cloud, this should should look somewhat familiar as far as how you create hierarchies and, and resources in there. There's some some hidden complexity or hidden considerations anyways, when you're looking at how you propagate permissions and, and ensure that that matches your organizational uh, structure internally, whether that's with, with teams or line of business or, or uh, environments, those sorts of things. And, and that's exactly where we like to come in and, and help our customers work through that. And again, uh, just accelerate the process of, of implementing this with confidence and, and knowing that you're in a, in a good state to take advantage of your, uh, your hybrid environment once we're done. So um, I know we'll have a, uh, an accompanying blog post going out today describing this, this use case that I've gone through as, as well as the uh, capabilities um, and very much looking forward to working with, uh, with any of you that are, are looking to jumping into this, uh, this environment. Thank you very much. Hi folks, we are going to um, go to a Q&A session, but first we're going to ask some quick questions for your chance to win a $100 gift card. If you want to go back to Kahoot with us, you can enter by your mobile device, your laptop, or use Zoom's uh, Kahoot app. And you'll want to enter this game pin that I'm showing on my screen, and I'll pull up the Kahoot game, which will also have that, that link as well. So we'll just give it a moment for folks to join and we'll see if uh, you all are missing the Olympics coverage and what type of uh, Olympics knowledge you all have. Okay, and with that, we are starting. Where did Tokyo get 3,500 tons of sand for their beach volleyball matches? I, I was quite interested in this. Vietnam, I guess some of you were paying attention. All right, Paul P, you're at the top. Question two, which two sports made their debut during the 2020 Summer Olympics? Oh, Captain Canada is moving to the top. Where will the 2022 Olympics be held? Beijing. Which legendary New Jersey singer's daughter participated in the Olympics? Okay, and that last question. What sport did his daughter compete in? Equestrian, yep. Thanks for participating. Let's see who won. ABC did not come out on top this time. James is second. Captain Canada is our winner. And with that, I will turn it back over to our host for some Q&A. Okay, 
Well, thank you for that, Kathy, and uh, congratulations to the winners. Um, we have one question into the Q&A right now as it relates to, uh, let's see, Ian Hugh has asked, we moved to, to Google Suite, would this help using this? Um, looks like Robin's answering, but uh, maybe you can take the, the mic here, Robin. Yeah, yeah, that's easier. Um, so it, it, Google, the, the Cloud Launchpad will help in terms of creating resources and a resource structure in Google Cloud that maps users in G Suite to just the, the resources they should have access to, but it doesn't cover the, the uh, workflow side of, of G Suite. So um, if, that, if that answers the question, it's, it's not a, a G Suite specific product, but it certainly does help um, if you're building out the Google Cloud infrastructure and, and needing to assign, assign those resources to, to users. All right, looks like that answered the question. Um, I did wanna, while people continue to put in questions here, uh, I wanted to uh, address the PowerPoint question. Um, we will be sending out a link to the registrants today uh, via email. The PowerPoint itself is way too large to send out um, as a file. So uh, we will send out again the recording and you guys can um, review that and, and share as needed. But uh, uh, feel free to type any additional questions into the chat and or Q&A. I have a quick question for our GCI folks. Um, can we use our uh, own IP addresses um, via BGP to connect? It's probably so I, I can answer that. Uh, by own IP address, you mean a non RFC 1918 IP. So, so your own public IP space, but privately used. Correct. Correct. And the answer is yes, you can. So we do support not only RFC 1918 address spaces, but also what we call privately used public IPs or PUPI for short. Uh, so our customers have the ability to use their own, let's say they, 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 they own a, a block of public IPs that they use internally uh, within their, their, their internal network infrastructure. They can use that uh, both uh, connecting to and from GCP or even use those inside GCP. So, so we have a full support of moving those IPs into GCP and routing them privately across the interconnect. Um, so that is, that's fully supported. Thank you. Keep the floor open for a few more moments. See if there's any other questions that come in. Okay. All right. Well, um, with that, uh, we did include the links here for uh, each of our partners that were on the uh, session today. So if you have any ad additional questions, you may be able to find the answers through the links that are provided. Um, I'd also like to encourage the uh, uh, potential customers for either of the, of the cl uh, Google Cloud Ops Guru um, and or CoLogix. Um, you know, for the physical side of it, reach out to uh, Jordan Scott or Callum, um, uh, Callum on our sales team there locally, and they be sure they'll be sure to take care of you. If there are any other questions, uh, feel free to reach out uh, to our webpage, and you guys can um, we'll address those questions as they come in accordingly. I thank everybody for joining us today, and uh, wish you a wonderful afternoon.